A warm welcome to everyone that tunes in to the Heart of Law podcast. I'm Marina Omiza, your host, and it gives me great pleasure to resume our insightful conversations with our guests. To our regular followers who may have noticed a temporary pause on our programming, I apologize. As my company underwent a period of rapid growth and transition, I took the opportunity to recalibrate and focus on our missions and core values. It is with renewed passion and enthusiasm that I return to our discussions on the whys and hows of the legal industry. I hold in the highest regard the community of lawyers who have devoted their lives to the pursuit of justice, placing the needs of others above their own and upholding the principles of advocacy with unwavering dedication. Today on the show, I have invited Mike Papantonio, also known as PAP, senior partner with the law firm of Levin Papantonio Rafferty. He has received numerous multi-million dollar verdicts on behalf of victims of corporate greed. His work handling thousands of master cases throughout the, the nation has helped make Levin Papantonio Rafferty one of the largest plaintiff law firms in the country. Pap is one of the few living attorneys inducted into the Trial Lawyer Hall of Fame. He's listed in publications Best Lawyers in America and Leading American Attorney. He's the host of the YouTube show America's Lawyer with close to a million subscribers where he provides in-depth investigations into major corporate greed and government corruption. Pap has authored and co-authored instructional articles on handling complex litigation for trial lawyers. He's the founder of the Cutting Edge Conference, Mass Torts Made Perfect, which trains thousands of lawyers on how to better their legal practices. Welcome to the show, Pap. How are you? Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. All good yeah. here. <laughs> we did a short, uh, you've been on my podcast before, so we did mm -hmm. a short conversation before, which really kind of left me wanting more and why I invited you back. What are you currently spending your time on? Uh, what are you working on? Just curious. Well, I, I would think uh, probably right now, and you'll hear about it in Vegas coming up here a couple of weeks. There's uh, out of the human trafficking cases, we ran into something um, that you have what you call trouble teen uh, institutions. And that is where a, a child may be anywhere from 10 to 16 years old put in um in, in these institutions that are supposed to make them better kids. They have problems maybe with not showing up at school, maybe just not listening to parents, some criminal activity, fairly minor. And they put them in these, these homes. Um, one of them is the Dozier, uh, the Dozier case in Florida. Everybody knows about There's been a couple of documentaries made on it. They're getting ready to make another documentary. And what we've been trying to do is we're trying to get these the folks that lived through the horror of that compensated. And um, it's too late to do anything from a legal, you know, there, there is no case here other than us to get legislator, Florida legislation that allows them to be compensated. This is a, this is a place in Mariana, Florida, where kids were raped, uh, they were murdered, they were literally beat to death, and then buried in, in, in graves, the unmarked graves. We're still finding bodies of kids that were buried. And um, it, it would be the kind of thing where they would beat a child to death, go bury him. Parents would call, how's little Johnny? Well, little Johnny got sick and, and we went ahead and buried him without any kind of autopsy or anything like that. So these these places are all over the country. And so we're going after the folks that uh, that are the kind of the backbone of all that. It's It's corporate. I mean, you have a couple of corporations that kind of run the whole program. And so I'm trying to build that out right now. And right now there's probably 50 facilities throughout the country that need to be sued because the same kind of things are going on. Not quite that bad, but a couple of them are that bad. Uh, and so that's that's kind of the latest thing we're paying attention to. Oh my goodness. Um, so you're saying to basically set up a fund for these children who are likely some into young adulthood, I'm assuming? Well, with Dozier, we're set up a fund. These other people, we're going to sue them into another hemisphere and gotcha. take all their money and take that money and give it to these folks that have been victimized. So wow. yeah, we have plenty of lawsuits. The lawsuits 
The only case that probably we don't have a lawsuit is Dozier because it, it, it took place, it started in uh, 1900. And, wow. and by as late as 19, as, as late as 2011, they mm -hmm. still had done nothing about it. It, it. Virtually every governor of Florida knew about it. Nobody did anything. The Florida legislature knew about it, didn't do anything because they were upset. They were afraid they're going to upset the panhandle voters here in Florida, where this Mariana, Florida is located. And just lack of courage, just, just downright political stupidity allowed it to go on all those years. And they had all the information they needed to understand how serious it was. But right now, maybe we can prevent it in some of these other facilities throughout the country. Yeah. Uh, you, you may remember Philadelphia where you had judges that were being getting kickbacks. They were getting paid kickbacks to send these kids to these horrible institutions there in Philadelphia. I do remember that, actually. Mm -hmm. It's funny because I crossed paths with somebody who was no longer a lawyer because they'd lost their license to that whole thing. Mm -hmm. It just was mm -hmm. bizarre. It doesn't surprise me. Yeah. A lot of people wow. should lose their license because yeah. of their involvement, something like that. It's true. So you're you're uh, you're obviously staying um, focused. There is always all kinds of new projects coming along, but what's been really exciting since the last time we talked is your daughter Sarah Papantonio has joined the firm, mm -hmm. and she's a lovely young lady that I've had the pleasure to meet and talk to. Um, she looks up to to you and what you've built, and it's it's very sweet to, just to see how proud well, she is. Well, thank you. That's nice of you to say that. Yeah. So how do you feel like having your daughter walking around <laughs> and mass towards me? Perfect. Well, you know, it's always a difficult, sometimes it's a difficult thing for a child to jump, to step into the shoes of their father or their mother that's been, that's built a career. But, you know, just like I tell her, it's her own career. She doesn't have to do anything I've done. She's, she, she has taken, uh, she's grown up around mass torts. She has been in trial with me so many times throughout the country, sat through depositions, attack depositions that are used in trial for some of the biggest cases in the country. And she understands how important it is. It's, it's like I've always said, and mass torts made perfect, I talk about the importance of the legacy case, and that is, when your child asks you, you know, mom, dad, what did you do, you know, with your career? You have a license just like everybody else has a license, right? What did you do with that license? And you want to be able to say, well, I cleaned up ecosystems. I got bad drugs off the market. I made Wall Street pay when they've taken money from mom and pop organizations or mom and pop pension programs. You want to be able to say you've done something that has some, you know, has some longevity to it, in, in fact, of the good that it does. So she's, she's grown up around that. I think it certainly has stuck with her. I mean, it's, it's kind of her, that's the basis of how she looks at what she has to do. But I think there are a lot of young lawyers coming up that, that are looking at the idea, yeah, it's interesting to do 1-800 auto crash for about three years, and then after you've done several thousand, you say, well, gee whiz, I mean, there's something else I can do with this license mm -hmm. uh, or workers comp, you know. Now, those people have to, no, don't get me wrong, they have to be represented. But lawyers have to make a decision about what it is that license means to them. Mm -hmm. Because that license can be used the same way uh, we used ours or some of, the, some of the biggest cases in the country. Yeah. If you look at, it was just a lawyer with a license. Yeah. And, um, you know, some some of these lawyers, they'll read a headline, Joe Smith gets a $10 billion settlement or hits a $3 billion verdict. And they go, well, why the hell can't I do that? Well, you can. You can do it. <laughs> Your license is no different than anybody else's. It's just that Joe Smith on that day saw that there was a, there, there was a need for it and they were motivated to do it. And they, 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 were, the, they were their best self as a lawyer. And that's and, and in the end, doing good, uh, you know, d doing well by doing some good means something. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think a lawyer that's going after, you know, a corporation and hitting them for a 10 million or billion, it really just, I guess, doesn't matter, but just has the courage to go out there, put themselves out there and 
and try and give it their all. Do you think there is certain ingredients that person needs to have? Yeah. Can you develop over time? Like what, what do you think after all these years? Well, I think of you, I think of you, all the programs that I see you walking around and you're doing your job. And I noticed that you're not afraid to do your job. You're not afraid of rejection. You're not afraid of failure. You're not afraid of being told no. You understand that what you do is all law of average, right? That's sales. Those are basic sales concepts. That there's nothing magic about what we do. You can be the greatest closer in the world. But if you're not, if you're, if you're not looking at cases and you're not taking risks and you're not afraid of fail, you're afraid of failure, you're never going to do anything significant. You're just going to be another Joe Schmo, you know, doing the same thing everybody else does, 1-800-WORKERS-COMP, 1-800-CAR CRASH. And you go, what the hell? I mean, this is what I went to law school for. This is how I want to be remembered as the guy in my little hometown that handled more car crashes than anybody. Understand, we're in Pensacola, Florida. Now, right. Pensacola, Florida is about... 80,000 people. Right. We've launched tobacco. Yeah. We've launched 80 of the largest pharmaceutical cases in the country. We launched opioids. We've launched human trafficking. We've launched the terrorism cases right here. So mm-hmm. it, it, it doesn't, you don't have to be in New York or LA. I mean, God forbid you should have to live in LA, right? Yeah. You don't have to live in LA. To, to do something significant. You can do it from your little hometown. Matter of fact, this uh, this program that I'm doing in Vegas, I'm going to be talking about, I'm opening the program with this very topic, this very thing we're talking about. It's funny because I have, I don't, like you and I have obviously seen each other, haven't really talked about everything, sort of how I morphed into the industry. And thank you for all the kind words, by the way. I, I learned that if I am, if I allow something to inspire me or somebody to inspire me, and I get inspired by causes quite a bit, um, that it just, I let that kind of flow through me and it, and I don't really have to try. Mm-hmm. So I, I get really inspired and I feel that what you do and what many lawyers and mass towards do in many ways is God's work. Um, because there is recourse in this country. I come from a country where there was no recourse, right? I grew up during communism. I remember the days. Mm -hmm, (laughs) And mm -hmm. I was a young child, but I remember the days. And I remember Mm -hmm. you didn't have a voice and especially as a woman, even less. So I don't take that for granted. But what I do see my observation in the past decade has been all these lawyers from small towns working on small cases <clears throat> Med Mal or, you know, the NEC cases or the Camp Lejeune cases. These are all people in their small little town. Yeah, making a difference. Stay, staying the course. And so how many lawyers are out there sitting on significant? Right. Problems? That's the point. That's the point. Right? Uh, you know, in Vegas, I'm going to be handing out. Um, hey, do we have an America's Lawyer T-shirt? I, I want to show you what, what I'm going to be handing out. I love it. It's a T-shirt. It's it's very very nice T-shirt. Okay. It's America. It's America's lawyer. Okay. Now I've taken my program, and I, I've said, well, what what was the purpose of that program? The purpose was to say that uh, I felt like what I was doing was important enough to say that I'm at least one America's lawyer. For for every what I do matters. So I'm going to be handing out T-shirts, and I'm thank you, Scott. I'm going to be reminding people. Everybody's going to have one of these right here. America's lawyer. (laughs) And I'm going to be saying, you know, the reason I gave you that T-shirt is because you have potential to be America's lawyer right there in your hometown. And and I'm going to talk about the idea of the lawyers that have stepped out. I think of Rob Balot. Rob was a dear friend of mine. Uh, Well, he now is. I didn't know him at all. He came to me and he said, Mike, I've worked up this case against DuPont. And I don't. I, I need y'all to try it for me. I need you to try it. Would you try it? And I looked at it, and he had done such an incredible job working up the first PFAS case. Mm-hmm. So I tried. We tried five of them in, uh, in 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 Ohio, in Columbus, Ohio, and we got every time we went and tried, it was a multi million dollar verdict. So they settled for almost a billion dollars. Those that handful of cases. But what came out of it was more important than that. What came out of it was uh, was finally government paying attention to how dangerous PFAS was. Mm-hmm. 
how it was killing people with toxins that were causing cancer and neurological disease and birth defects. And nobody even knew what the hell it was. And then they do a movie. It's the first movie they did was, was called The Devil We Know. It was a documentary. And yeah. then they do another movie. It was called uh, 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 Dark Waters. And, and so all of a sudden, then the American public is waking up to the idea that the water that they're drinking out of their tap has, it, it has PFAS in it. Yeah. <laughs> More than likely it has PFAS. And it has potential to kill you and to cause all types of injuries to your children. But Rob, <laughs> almost impossible odds, puts this case together. He's working for a defense firm. Hell, they're wanting to fire him all the time because he's doing this crazy case. Yeah. Well, now that crazy case is the biggest case in the country. It's, it's, it, the, the impact of it is massive. Yeah. So, so out of that comes a government movement, activist movement, and it, it just explodes throughout the country. Or, or how about, you know, I think of, uh, I think of the Burrell case. Uh, the lawyer, I'm trying to think of his name right now. Uh, he, he hired, uh, he handled, uh, yeah, it was Ward Stevenson. A guy named yeah. Ward Stevenson, most people have never even heard of. Right. Ward takes on the Burrell v. Fireboard case. Uh, that was uh, an asbestos case, excuse me. And he <laughs> comes out of nowhere. Nobody knew who he was. He tries the first four cases. I think three of them were lost. But he stays with it. And he builds a movement in this country that attracts lawyers like Fred Barron and, and, uh, and, and, and Ron Motley and attracted me as a very young lawyer. Hell, I was a kid. But I could see this is a big project. And asbestos litigation starts all over the country. I could say the same thing about tobacco. Some, some, I mean, I'm, this, these stories go on forever. Here you got this lawyer out of nowhere, Mark, yeah, Mark Adele, M-A-R-C Adele. Nobody's ever heard of this guy. But he handled the Cipollone case against Liggett. Out of that came, then we got involved. We took a look at what he was doing. We said, can we make it better? And so we build on that and we launched the biggest litigation in America, the tobacco litigation right here in Pitsco, Florida. Yeah. You see. But and, and then, but the point being out of his effort to say, I'm not, you know, I like doing auto cases, but my God, I want to use my license for something bigger. Out of that comes all of these remarkable movements that take place throughout the entire country. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we now have less death because of tobacco. Right. And so I think that's the way you have to look at it. Do you think any one of these lawyers looked at that and said, yeah, this is going to be an easy road? Hell yeah. no. no. They looked at it and said, this is going to be impossible. But they did it. You see. Yeah. It, it's, it's amazing because that's the yin and the yang in mass torts that I think, and I'd love to kind of get your thoughts on this too, that you have these lawyers. These are the, the where it, these great litigations come and stem from. And then you have big firms like yours with the resources, with uh, the talent to help basically magnify the cause even more. Sometimes you guys start your own litigations and other times you come to somebody's rescues mm -hmm. essentially. But then you have this other movement, right, in mass torts, which is some lawyers and maybe many lawyers look at mass torts as a passive investment. And it's purely like a, a business play, but it's not even a good play because, you know, you kind of don't have control of your cases when you're not actively in involved. And then when you don't have control of your destiny, you're just kind of waiting to see and ultimately, just the clients suffer the consequences because people aren't, you know, the right folks aren't touching the clients, aren't working up the cases. What are your thoughts on sort of that side? Would you call well, that? Let, let, me co let, me co let me come back to you, okay? Let me come back to you because I've watched you over the years. You, I mean, you were, hell, you were a kid. I mean, the <laughs> first time I saw you, I thought you were like 18 years old. And you're out there walking, you're, 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 you're out in a program, a sea of lawyers. And what are you looking for? I remember early conversations. What were you looking for? You were looking for some, somebody, A, that you felt comfortable saying, I want to help you finance this thing that you're trying to do. But some things matter to me. A, do you have the ability to go the distance? Mm -hmm. B, can I trust you? C, 
do you do you understand what this is going to take to pull off real hard work d you're not a you you you, you look for people that weren't afraid to co-counsel with other big organizations they might be a small organization but i i remember time after time i'd come i'd come uh, lawyers and company that had talked to you and said, well, yeah, I want to get a loan. I, I need money, but I, I think I need your organization to help me get started with it. I need a bigger organization, at least for the couple of first couple of projects. And then they do something on their own, which is fine with us. Our goal is to help them build and help them be able to stand on their own. And most of the time that can happen after about two projects. I, were, I met with, I was in Houston uh, just this weekend meeting with a young lawyer there that and I'm, I'm trying to get him to understand that I know what you want to do. I know you have this vision of wanting to do great things and you will, but you have to have a plan, right? You have to have the staff. You have to have the staying power. You have to have more than a loan from a finance company. You have to have ability. You have to have experience. You have to have connections of people that have been doing this for 40 years. You don't just walk into one of these projects and they pay any attention to you you got to prove yourself mm -hmm. and so i think when you first started you recognize that right off the bat and i think that's how you've built your practice it appears to me that's what you've done i mean i know many of the lawyers that you're working with and they're exactly the same lawyers i'd work with you know mm -hmm. so there's an ug there's another ugly side to it though and that is that out there's a lot of money. There's just money. It, it, you know, it's, it's just money on the street. And people say, well, I'm a finance company. I'm just going to spread money out. Well, here's where it goes bad. Mm -hmm. You give $5 million to some two-man firm, two-person firm. They have two paralegals. They've got a, a total of 10 employees. You know, they're in a strip mall. And they're told, well, go out and get these cases. So they go get the cases and they end up with 3,000 cases, right? Yeah. They don't have the ability to handle those 3,000 cases. They, can, they don't, they, you know, they're probably good comp lawyers. They might be good uh, auto crash lawyers, but they don't have, they don't have that, that extra that it takes to take a mass tort case and really go to trial in right. four or five different jurisdictions if they have to. Right. So what happens to them? More importantly, what happens to their clients? Right. The clients believe that they've hired the right law firm. Clients don't know any different. They think a law firm is a law firm is a law firm. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah, don't make any difference. We're the biggest. We're the best. We're, you know, whatever. They don't know any different. So they go hire that firm and their, their, their case languishes. And while their case is languishing, that's the defendant is settling with me because I'm getting ready to go to trial. I'm going to trial and I got three bellwether cases lined up to go to trial against them. Well, of course they're going to settle with me. And then after they settle with me, this young, these, this, this two person firm is kind of out on their own. I mean, they're, they're called inventory settlements. That's what started happening in this country. And it has to happen. Otherwise there's no way, there's no way a defense firm can even evaluate Mm -hmm. what the value of a case is unless they do inventory settlements now. So I, they, they, they pay me, you know, they pay Perry White's, they pay Chris Seeger, they pay Lanier, they pay a handful of people. And then everybody else is holding their cases mm -hmm. and they can't go to trial. It, let, let's say cases were remanded. They can't go to trial in five different jurisdictions. Well, we're used to it. We tried asbestos for, you know, 20 years. So the people loaning that money then become a target, you understand, because ultimately that client, that client is sitting out there, they're, they're being asked to take $10,000 where uh, an inventory settlement took place was they're getting $120,000. Yeah. And then they make a telephone call and, you know, they're, they're wondering, well, what, I have exactly the same injury my neighbor had. I got $10,000. They got $110,000. What's the difference? Well, it's a lawsuit. Right. And some firm is going to sue that two-person firm. And then they're also going to go after the financier because the financier should have done their due diligence, should have understood that it was impossible for that person to be able to handle this. So, I mean, it's fraught with problems 
they're all fixable. Uh, they're all, it's, it's, it's as easy as saying, I want to know who you're doing business with. Mm -hmm. You're a two person firm. If you get into trouble in this, and there's a big demand, and you've got to go try cases all over the country, who are you doing business with? Right. Okay. And I think you kind of, you've, you've kind of led lawyers to us in the past uh, that, you know, hopefully we're going to help them because yeah. there's no way they could have landed it without our help. And I, yeah. I don't mean that in a braggadocious way. It's just a simple thing. This is all we do. We've, been doing, it, we've been doing it for 40 years, yeah. for God's sakes. You so, know. I mean, a big reason why I wanted to have you on the podcast is to talk about Wall Street and the legal business, because I've heard you now at MTMP. I've heard you in other panels, basically talk about these very same issues. Mm. And as you know, that's the business I'm in. And I caught, you know, that very first wave of money. I, I'm going to call, I'm going to say, this is my perspective, right, of the business. Uh, it wasn't until BP oil spill that the, the capital from Wall Street uh, truly entered the mass tort world. Mm -hmm. It was right around BP oil spill. This was, you know, there was like thousands, if not probably close to 100,000 claims that were open, that BP basically was dragging their feet, did not want to pay. And these firms were about to collapse. There was no resources. There's no way that you can sustain those kinds of claims with a line of credit. I mean, you and I know the banks don't understand this business. Yeah, they know. There was an opportunity for Wall Street to come in. Uh, BP was that case, that perfect storm. And all these firms that ended up with the largest inventories fortunately got some capital infusion and basically said, okay, let's keep fighting. So from that context, it was a positive. It was like the playing field was, was, you know, you, you could even the playing field. And then as money kept coming in, you had all these capital sources that now didn't know anything about the legal business, didn't know who the players were, didn't understand anything about a law it was pathetic, yeah. and just started pouring money into yeah. the business to the point where I couldn't keep up with the demand of capital, right? Mm -hmm. From the side saying, wait, I want a piece of this. If there is like just money on the street, I want some of this. And then I couldn't keep up with the diligence. Most of the time, the diligence was very superficial. Now, this is back 2015, 2014, 2015. Um, fast forward to where we are in like, would say the past three years, the lenders that started back then have become really seasoned about the business. Now I they think, have, I think you're right. Yeah. You know, so now they don't want to bet on the wrong horse. They're like, if I'm going to put my money with somebody it's going to be with the guy that tries the case is on leadership position has the biggest inventory, the greatest chance to success. Yeah. I've been on many. That's calls. just the logical thing to do here. That's I, I right. think it's risky not to. And I don't, I, I've been preaching this for years now. Why would you? No, don't get me wrong. I love to see people emerging in the business. Mm -hmm. If you've got two very motivated lawyers that say, look, I want to use my license for something bigger. I, they ought to get some help, but right. they ought to get real help. And the help is to say, okay, let's do that. Let me put a consortium together for you. This is your team. This is, I'm going to loan you the money, but this is the team. And this team's going to make sure that you can deliver from beginning to end. If things go bad, if a man takes place and you're holding 5,000 cases, you know, yeah. you can deal with it. You know, whatever that team is. Yeah. So it's doable. But people have to be realistic about it. The problem, the, the downside to it is the money is not flowing just to the just to uh, just to lawyers that even have enough that have enough sense to say, I need a consortium, I need to, I need a team. The lawyer, some of that money is going to, to organizations that aren't even lawyers, like they're advertisers, yeah. they're acquisition people. Yeah, that's a problem. And they're using, I mean, our law firm. Yeah, got sued for something we didn't have anything to do with, and it was had to do with robocalls because some cat, I guess, is out there using our name in a robocall. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. so all of a sudden, these people that aren't even lawyers are popping up. Yeah. And and they're going after cases. You know, they're they're. I don't have. We don't have control over that. 
All I have control over is the co-counselor that I'm working with. We can tell them these are the rules. This is what you must do. But these, you know, these folks that are out there operating on their own, part of that money is going to them. And, and I got to tell you something. It's just a matter of time. I, I predict a yeah. big, big mega lawsuit taking place. Okay. You heard it here first. Matter of fact, I'm already seeing the edges of it. So that money that's flowing to these case acquisition people where they're taking, we're, we're finding that they're actually taking cases and selling them to three different people. Yeah, I know. Okay, there's all kinds of scams going on. Yeah. But here's what people don't understand. If I go after that entity, that case acquisition person, I don't stop there. Mm -hmm. I go after the money behind it. Mm -hmm. You see, I go to Wall Street. Yeah. And so if they're making loans to people like that, it's just a matter of time. I think that's absolutely a big problem. The other problem I think that I've actually witnessed firsthand is that you do have these passive lawyers that do get financing, that throw $5 million uh, at every advertiser for campaigns. They are, have no oversight. They just kind of let them run yeah. with it. And then they're doing everything they can to basically sell that lead three times and make three times the money on every yeah. client. What do you think that lawsuit's going to look like? I mean, what, what do you think it's going to look like when I have that that organization across the table for me in deposition? I mean, it's and 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 then more importantly, yeah. what do you think the lawsuit going to look like when I have the Wall Street person who loaned that entity money across the table, and I talk about the due diligence issues? Yeah. It's yeah. just so risky. I don't know why. I, I know it's a money frenzy out there right now, but I don't know why people in this business don't get it. You can make a lot of money, but you're going to lose it. You're going to lose every bit of it in big lawsuit. So there is no regulation, right? So like None, no that, regulation is that where it's headed. I mean, do you think? There no, but there, but there's common law fraud. There's common law fraud. And you sell the same case to three people. Yeah. Or you sell a name. I mean, how about, uh, you know, you were talking about BP. We had a, we had an acquisition group come to us and I, I, we looked at their inventory. We said, what the hell? Half these people, we don't even know who they are. We can't even find them. We did because we investigate. And so we took a pass on. It. And then uh, they went to another lawyer. He didn't take a pass. He ended up getting criminally prosecuted, criminally prosecuted for that inventory. Wow. That's so crazy. it's it's this money frenzy has got to stop, man. I mean, people in this business. I don't know who sees this this uh, uh, the, this a lot of lawyers <laughs> program. Okay, well, I hope Wall Street sees it. Wall Street's one. Yeah, and, and Wall Street. Wall I Street. Mean, Street. Wall Street. If if they're not watching this and listening to me right now, <laughs> they're they're making a big mistake because it's yeah. getting ready to happen. I, look, I work with a lot of capital sources, and I take it very personal to educate these lenders about my clients because I represent the law firms. And I never, and I've even had lenders on the other side say, you know, if you bring me this deal, we'll compensate you. I make it very clear that my client is my law firm, and so I'm looking out for them. And therefore, I want to make sure they know what they're getting well, into. Well, what you do matters. I mean, you put the lender together with somebody that is that that can handle the issue, right? They can handle the case. Yeah. You put the lender together with an organization that makes sense. You got you got crazy money out there though, right now. You got crazy money, but and everybody just sees an opportunity. They say, "I'm going to pick up three percent here, four percent here, five yeah. percent here." And by the time it's all over, this feeding frenzy, everybody doesn't understand they're on the hook. To be you, fair, the attorneys also play a part, okay? Because attorneys, <laughs> bless their hearts, I have attorneys who won't even read their loan agreement. Oh, I know. And if they okay. read it, they don't understand it. <laughs> you know? So like I a really monkey watching television when you read some of these things. <laughs> if you're going to ask for money, you have to get educated on what that means, what the implications are, because the only reason there is so much money available is because there is so much demand, right? I mean, every lawyer now right. has access to capital. Okay. Let me tell you what my prediction is. Mm -hmm. The demand is going to get even more because you have the, you have the, uh, the, ass, the ass clown Republicans. 
yeah. out now trying to get engaged state by state into deconstructing uh, the it, uh, personal injury cases in their in their state. You've got it going on in about 30 states right now. For example, I'm in Florida, and you had these ass clowns in Tallahassee that wrote legislation that completely takes the rights away from people. I mean, it just destroys I lawsuits. Know. That's insane. Okay. Okay. So if I were if I were a single event lawyer, yeah, I would be freaked out right now yeah. if I built if I built my practice around auto cases and workers' compensation, even in high volume, yeah. I'd be very worried. Right. But you're going to start, so you're going to see an expansion of mass torts because that's the answer. You see, I don't have any boundaries on where I practice law. My cases come from California, New York, New Mexico, Canada. They come from all over the world. My God, we're even in Europe right now. Yeah. So I don't really worry about what the ass clowns do in Tallahassee. Okay, it doesn't make any difference to me. I mean, I hate that that it makes a difference in that I hate to see what's happening with consumers. Right. And moreover, I hate to see that the guy driving it, DeSantis, is running for president of the United States because that's a reflection of what he's going to do when he gets into power, and he has a very good chance of winning. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So I care to that degree, but I don't. It doesn't. It doesn't interrupt my business. Uh, uh, program at all yeah. i was just shocked by that it just seemed yeah. so it's you talk about wall street and insurance companies just controlling and having that and and that kind of brings me to like arizona as you know arizona allows for non-lawyers and lawyers yeah to yeah and people, that's a big deal right well you know people don't understand what happened there it's a big deal we're involved with it because we have to be we we had Half a dozen people setting ABSs out there said, can y'all do this with us? <laughs> and so we've landed in one. But that wasn't done to help lawyers. That was the that was the Supreme Court in Arizona trying to punch plaintiff's lawyers squarely in the face and bloody them up. They were thinking, why should you have exclusive right to these cases? Why can't I give it to my business pal here who has $20 million that wants to also be involved in taking fees? So people that look at it, there's, there's nothing liberal about that. This was a knee-jerk, conservative, ugly thing they did. And, um, you know, other states that have looked at it, they get it. It's, it's, it's all about... It's all about some political favor to big business. That's what this is. So yeah, that's it's a reality. It's taken place, no question. And yeah. I don't know where it's going to go. We're, we're we're trying to deal with it as it develops. Yeah. No, I mean, I've kind of I'm I'm actually very sort of in the loop because it's very interesting, right? But like everything else in life, right? There is a yin and a yang, and it depends what kind of capital partner becomes partners with a firm and then what kind of access they have to uh, or say so they have to the direction of a litigation say right if this is, yeah this is even more dangerous because here they're advertising out of centralized firm abs there in arizona but they're going after national cases the yeah. volume is going to be substantial yeah. what do they do with those cases i mean if they don't have a good plan okay this is a trucking accident case. I have these five lawyers that I'm going to give it to. They've got to have a good plan to make that work. And if it's not well thought out, um, it's destined to fail. You know? Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about politics in mass torts. Um, Cause it's been interesting to see that, I mean, there's politics in every industry, right? But yeah. every time a new exciting litigation comes along, you can see different camps <laughs> emerge. Oh yeah. That's always been the case. Right. And, but, you know, I've always been a distant observer and I work with different people. So sometimes I'm working with two camps that don't really like each other and hmm. I've been caught in some dynamics, which is, yeah. Just I mean, the, the idea of two camps, not like, I mean, come on, this is a grown up game, right? You know, right. not liking somebody is it's stupid. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, look <laughs> in Vegas, all you got to do is look at the stage. I put all of my competitors up on the stage, 
Okay. I don't have, I don't worry about them. And if you have confidence in yourself, I call it turning your back on the bull. Mm -hmm. It's like a, it, it's, it's, it's like a matador in a, in an arena with a bull that wants to kill him. Well, the matador, if he's real good and he's real confident and he ain't, you know, he's not worried about, is the bull going to, bull going to kill me? He'll turn his back on the bull, get on one knee. And it's called turning your back on the bull. If you don't have enough courage to do that as a lawyer, you're in the wrong damn business. I mean, you are just in the wrong business. People ask me all, all the time, Pap, why do you put your bigger competitor, biggest competitors up on the stage in Vegas? Why do you let them speak? Because I'm not worried about it. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I got the confidence to say, what the hell? I, I, I'm not worried about them. I know, I know we're going to accomplish what we want to accomplish. And the idea of this organization not liking that organization is a reality in this business that you're seeing. And I think you hit it on the head. And I go, it just makes no sense. It's so, it's so sophomoric. It's there's, very people, there's people that are always going to be mm -hmm. trying to outdo you, trying to, you know, trying to somehow interfere with what you're doing. I mean, hell, I've had that for 40 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's, it's always going on. People trying to keep me out of this and keep me out. I don't worry about it. I mean, you know, I guess I have Italian Alzheimer's and that means you, you forget everybody, you forget about everything except the people that have messed with you, you see? And yeah. so I have, I do have Italian Alzheimer's, but the point being ultimately, you know, it's a problem for them. And I think yeah. you have to have that kind of attitude. I know it's, it's, yeah. So. The politics in this business is there shouldn't be, we should all get along. Uh, I, but you, you, I, you, you, const, you probably constantly hear about people trying to undermine me. I don't care. I just don't care. It, it doesn't, it does nothing. It, and if I worry about it, all I'm doing is using up energy. Yeah. I, I, let me use my energy for something constructive. If I really feel like somebody has threatened this law firm, ultimately, I mean, I'll be very blunt with you. Ultimately, there's going to be a prize mm -hmm. somewhere, but I don't internalize it. And I don't, you know, I don't let it bother me. Yeah. Uh, it's sophomoric. Best way I can tell you. I, I honestly um, have sort of navigated through some of that, but seeing that while there is this fighting, high school fighting, you know, <laughs> at this well level, put. Well put. Uh, what it's really doing, it's, it's affecting the flow of the litigation and how sure long cycles go for. And ultimately it affects these clients. And instead of this industry being the, you know, the place where people go to feel represented and, and advocated for, it's like a cage, you know, it's, it's like you get stuck, the, the consumer is the bird and the, the legal industry becomes the cage and then you, 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 you've got a consumer just waiting for longer and longer cycles of litigation to get compensation. And sometimes yeah. that compensation isn't even fair, right? Well, let, let me tell you, it's destructive. I'll, I'll tell you a story, and I feel, I feel fine telling it. Um, dear friend of mine, uh, Richard Arsenault, very, very good lawyer, and was a friend for many, many years. Somehow we got sideways. I didn't, but somebody in my firm did. And for 10 years, we lost that relationship, okay? I lost relationship with a lawyer that adds quality mm -hmm. to everything he touches. Mm -hmm. uh, and so with Arsenault, I, I, just several weeks ago, I, I saw him. I was at, giving a speech, uh, some program mm -hmm. down in South Florida. And I said, Richard... I'm sorry for whatever happened. I don't even, I mean, I would hear bits and pieces. I don't know what happened. Mm -hmm. And when we started talking, nothing happened. But it was this belief that something big had happened and it separated me from one of the, a very talented, very talented lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I think in the, in the, and it hurt both of us. It hurt both of our ability to be able to do what we do. Right. Um, you know, for some reason, for a long time, people somehow believe that Mark Lanier and I weren't friends. Well, we're very good friends. I, I, was, I, I have li heard that. <laughs> I, I listened to his, I listened to his pot. You know, he has a podcast he does every day on the yeah. Bible. I listen to it all the time. He's a dear friend of mine, but then people say, well, for some reason, don't think we're friends. Right. Well, it's just, it's that sophomoric yeah. idiocy. 
yeah. that it, that exists in our business and we should have grown through it i mean you should have grown through it after high school you know yeah, yeah. so I, I, I don't know it's it's uh it's it's a reality it's always going to be there it's human i guess yeah last question um your firm has morphed uh over the decades at least in the last decade that i've seen it's it's morphed and become even more um you know, competent and powerful and mass torts, and you continue to lead the way in many ways. But, you know, so you went from like a full service firm, and then you went to into a personal injury mm. firm, and then mass torts. What's next? Like, I'm thinking international, I'm thinking something big. Yeah, it's international. We're, we're, we're headed that way. Although there's still, okay. I'm hoping some folks will go international, and I'll stick around here and handle <laughs> But, but yeah, there's so much, there's so much to do. There's so much to do. Yeah. And, um, and, and I, I think the most important thing is that one thing is that, that we communicate. I, I did a, I did a, a segment for uh, Brian Alstock. Um, he was having a, he had a program out in um, Big Sky, Montana. Okay. And he had judges there and he had, he had defense lawyers there, you know, plaintiffs. And now we don't do that. We have a plaintiff's program exclusive. We don't let defense lawyers listen to what we do. We don't do that. But I thought what he was doing was important because it, it put everybody in a room. It's, it's what uh, Jamie Dodd does, right? They, Jamie Dodge does that. Yeah. Richard Arsenault does that. They put on these, these programs where you got defense lawyers and judges and plaintiffs in, 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 in the room. And I think one thing we got to be able to do is talk to each other and communicate. Right now, we're under we're under attack. I, this, this. As a matter of fact, I was just reading this. This is called the judicature, mm -hmm. and some creep uh, woman name is Susan Spalding attacks me personally in this thing that goes to judge. This goes to federal judges, and she attacks me as a person who's trying to undermine democracy, <laughs> trying to undermine democracy. And the reason, and then we find out she's getting her money from Johnson and Johnson and uh, uh, Dup I mean, all the big, all the big companies. I mean, everybody we've sued. BP, she's getting her money from BP. She's getting her money from Johnson and Johnson and uh, the Koch brothers. So, so the reason that's important is this is just starting to surface again, and it's part of this big attack that's taking place. It will. We're going to see it this year. And you're going to see it next year in your state, wherever you are, where they tried to just completely destroy your ability to go to court. This woman, Susan Spaulding, was kind of the leading edge of that. She attacked me, I guess, because I got a big target on my back because I do, you know, because the mass torts made perfect. Right. But but so this is the new phase of this is the new phase of going after lawyers. It's the same thing that uh, we saw in the 60s where tort reform hit. And then we saw it again in the 80s. And now we're seeing it again. It's corporate entities that are, you know, they're the they're the money behind these these folks that are trying to deconstruct what we do. Wow. So we yeah. gotta be gotta be in a room talking is the point, point I'm trying to make. Yeah. To protect to protect the the integrity of what you do. I'm assuming, look, if they can't fight you in trial, or sometimes they have no choice, but if they feel inferior to a team in trial, they're gonna find other ways yeah that's right down that's the right. morale and and so good thing is you've got a pretty thick italian skin so you're not going <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's just hey it's all business right it's just business right that's right so, well pap thank you so much you're well awesome. thank you for allowing me to do this I, I hope uh make sure wall street sees this okay <laughs> <laughs> well, I've got a following, actually. Oh, I, I know. I, I know. Hear you. <laughs> well, you know, here's here's why you have a following, because people will talk to you. If yeah. some jack leg from Wall Street called me up and said, "Hey, Pap, I want you, I want you to do this," said, no, that's probably not going to happen. <laughs> but uh, you know, you've yeah. been in this business so long, and people trust you, and they should, and yeah. they have a reason to believe in you. So. Uh, hopefully, if you have another interview you want to do, just give me a call. Give me a, give me a little heads up, okay? I will. Thank you so much. Take Thank care. You. Bye bye. Bye bye. <laughs>